Good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Paul Brown. I'm the Communications Manager at the MRC Epidemiology Unit in Cambridge, and I'd like to welcome you all to the open tonight's Open Cambridge event on the Edible England theme that's been running. Um, and tonight's event with us is a discussion with um, Angela Mulligan and Tony Steer from our dietary assessment team, who will be discussing the National Diet and Nutrition Survey and what it can tell us about how diet in the UK has changed over the last, um, the last few decades. Um, they will talk for about 35 to 40 minutes, after which we'll have some time for some discussion and questions from the audience. Um, to ask your question, please submit it in, in the chat box, at, which is at the bottom of your Zoom, on the bottom Zoom bar, and it will appear on the right-hand side. If you can ask your question in there, um, uh, you'll be muted, you're, everyone is muted when they join, and if, if you want to actually read out your question in person, then um, then you know, please state that you'd like to be unmuted for that, otherwise we, uh, we'll read it out for you. Um, this talk is being recorded, uh, we were hoping to share that later, um, so if you don't want to appear in it, please turn off your video, and that probably also helps in certain bandwidth, uh, which can be an issue when you get a lot of people joining these meetings. Um, so, I'm going to do a proceed to the next slide. Okay, so um, I think uh, during this um, presentation, um, Tony and Angela will be running a few polls to ask you guys some questions um, during during the during, during the talk. Um, and to just get started, we'll be doing this uh, Zoom polling. Um, we'll start with a question about where you're joining us from. So, so we're aware that there might be people joining us from quite far away from Cambridge. So it'd be nice to see, see where you all are. So uh, if you just bear with me a second, I will zoom a little bit. Will allow me to see. Um, I will run the poll. Okay, I'll just give you a, a few um, a few seconds, maybe half a minute or so, just to all answer this poll. Apologies for the problem problem with the presentation. Then I think I'm clicking on the wrong place. Just give it another second. Okay. Okay, I think as you can see from this, uh, most of the people are, are most of you are joining us from the UK, um, some in Cambridge, uh, but there are some people joining us from outside the UK, at least uh, five according to this. So I will end that poll. Um, Okay, and um, have you done that? Let's. Um, I'll hand you over to uh, Tony, who'll um, start introducing the National Diet and Nutrition Survey. Thanks, Paul. Um, I can still see your your poll. Actually, I don't know if it's going to disappear. I think you can just close it yourself, Tony. Yeah. Okay, um, good evening and welcome and um, thank you for joining us this evening. It's, it's really great to see lots of people joining us. Um, and as Paul mentioned, this is, this is really a, a quick peek at uh, the National Diet and Nutrition Survey and um, having a look at the sorts of dietary assessment methods that we use behind the scenes. So um, just to... Um, go over in a little bit more detail about what we're going to cover this evening. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about the history of dietary assessment very briefly. Um, and then I'm going to introduce the National Diet and Nutrition Survey, a little bit about how we do it, um, share some uh, example data of the kind of things that we can get out of the NDNS, and um, then go on to sort of show a little bit more behind the scenes and then it's your turn. So um, as Paul mentioned, there's going to be a practical exercise, which we hope that you'll find interesting. And then we'll wrap up with a little bit more of the 
the future of dietary assessment and the future of the, the NDNS in dietary assessment. So um, we hope it's a, an interesting, informative session. So just before we start to introduce myself um, and Angela, so um, we are both nutritionists and we between us have quite a few years of dietary assessment experience. I won't want to say how many years, but um, several years of dietary assessment specialist experience. And we work in the dietary assessment team, which is part of a, a measurement platform, which is hosted by MRC Epidemiology at the University of, of Cambridge. Now, we put this session together with the help of um, our great team, and particularly we want to thank Susanna Abraham, Paul Brown, um, Dave Collins, our statistician, Steph Moore, and Polly Page, the head of our, our Dutch assessment team. And of course, those people that we work with at Nats and Social Research who, who work very closely with us on the survey. So a very, very brief um, introduction to, to dietary assessment for those people who haven't sort of really thought about it or, or might not be aware of it so much. Um, it's about recording what you eat and about looking in some detail about um, the foods that you consume. Now, the concept of dietary assessment is not particularly new, and this is a slightly lighthearted comment about the fact that this is Samuel Pepys and um, he really loved writing down in quite some detail um, all the things that he liked to um, eat and you can quite often see that in some of his diary um, that he liked to record all his foods but more seriously um, the idea or the interest in dietary assessment and measuring what people ate or eat um, really emerged in the, the early 20th century um, and particularly when we um, were looking at the stature of uh, recruits, soldiers into the First World War, that there was a real consideration of the links between nutrition and health and therefore really understanding what people were eating. So if you fast forward now, um, the interest in this began to grow um, and by the 1940s, um, what we had was our first UK really comprehensive set of food composition tables. And this was really important for dietary assessment because if you know um, the chemical analysis or the chemical composition of your foods, in other words, the vitamins and the minerals, um, the energy in your foods, then actually um, it can enable you to really start assessing people's diets in quite some detail. So there's a dietary assessment history in about 30 seconds. Um, so if you come forward, and this is where I'm really going to introduce the National Diet and Nutrition Survey. So the NDNS, as I'm going to shorten it to, really came um, about in the 1980s. And I'll come back to that in a minute. But um, the NDNS really is um, a really comprehensive, detailed UK survey, which looks in some detail at the individual intakes of um, the foods that people consume and therefore their nutrient intake as well. I will just mention at this stage that um, we do also look at the nutritional status in the survey, and that means using uh, blood and urine samples to look at status, but I'm not, not going to cover that so much this evening. It's more about the dietary assessment and the techniques that we use. Um, so this um, uh, survey is funded by Public Health England and the Food Standards Agency. And back in the 1980s and, and onwards into the 90s, the survey was run as, as discrete surveys. So it picked um, a group of um, people in a specific age group. So for example, just adults or just elderly people or, or just young people and looked in some detail at what they ate. But from 2008 onwards, um, we, the survey was converted to what we call a rolling program. And what we do now is every year we sample a representative sample of the UK population, around about a thousand people. And that's from the age of one and a half upwards. So it covers all ages. Um, and then the, the, the purpose really is so that we can get 
a really good detailed understanding of um, people's food intake. And we can start to understand whether there are any concerns around particularly low intakes of nutrients or high intakes of nutrients. And more importantly, we can also monitor um, public health policies and nutrition policies. So we can look at how well we're doing against these targets. And that's quite important. So just before I show you some results from the NDNS, and I realize that some people might not know or might not be aware of the kind of the, 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 the basics of dietary assessment, I thought I'd just run through what we mean by dietary assessment. So um, understanding what people eat, um, you could follow somebody around all day and you could observe what they're eating, or you could ask them to take a duplicate copy of their meals and send it off to you in a lab and you could analyze it and you could work out what their food and nutrient intake was. But I guess, as you can imagine, this kind of exercise would be really time consuming and really expensive to do. Um, and so therefore trying to do that in big population samples is not really um, practical. So what we do and what most techniques focus on is asking the individual to record what they've had. Um, and normally we ask people to record in a food diary. So we ask them to record what they're eating as they're going along. Or we might ask them to do it in what we call a 24 hour recall, where we take them through a series of questions and we ask them about what they had in the previous 24 hours. But it relies on memory and it relies on, on people recording everything that they had. So the two key things that we need in that record are the foods. So we really need to know what the food is, what fruit or what vegetable or what dish it was, what sandwich it was, and a really good description of that food so that we know all the ingredients in it um, and um, therefore we can work out the food composition. The other key piece of information that we need in dietary assessment is portion size. So as well as the detail about the food, we need to know how much of it someone has eaten. Once we've got those two pieces of information in their record, we can then look at the foods against a food composition database. And this database, as I mentioned earlier, like the McCanson Widdison, has got food codes which have all the vitamins and minerals and energy, carbohydrates and fats for all the individual foods that we need to know about. Once you've got your food code assigned to your food, you can then multiply it by your portion size that was reported. And this enables you to arrive at that individual's nutrient intake. So um, that's the sort of a dietary assessment principles in one slide. Um, but as you can imagine, there's, there's, there's lots more complexity to it, but it, it hopefully helps people feel that they know what we mean by dietary assessment. So um, this is the next Zoom poll question. So here, I'm quite interested to know in the audience, um, having described what you have to do for dietary assessment, and here you can see a picture of a record of somebody writing down what they've had to eat. I'd like to know um, how long you think you'd be prepared to keep a food diary for. Um, so the options are one day, four days, one week, one month, or one year. Um, and I think, Paul, you've got a Zoom poll question. So if you enter your responses now. Um, still moving. Mm, I think that looks like it slowed down a bit. Okay. That's really interesting. It looks like the majority of you would be kind of okay to do it for around a week. Um, a few people, four days. Um, and we've got some real daring, brave souls up there who say that they would um, do it for a year. 
Um, that's really interesting, actually, because um, back in the 1980s in the US, there was one particular study where a group of really dedicated students did actually keep food records for a whole year. Um, so those four of you that chose that, well done. <laughs> Thanks, Paul. I think um, I'll move on. I'll just close this now. OK, so let's get back to the NDNS after we've looked at dietary assessment principles. So you might be wondering how we measure dietary intake in the NDNS. So as we're going back through the decades, um, I thought I'd just give you the sort of the history. So up until recently, pretty much to about 2018, we have always kept of asked people to keep a food diary. So we've asked them to write down and record what they've had to eat. So in the 1980s and 1990s and even beginning of 2000s, we asked people to record what they ate in their diary and we asked them to weigh their food. So we asked them to weigh all, all their food. And as you can imagine, over seven days um, and weighing your food, that's actually quite a lot to ask somebody to do. It's quite time consuming. So in the later decades from um, 2008 to 2018, we switched methods slightly and we asked people to record four days and we asked them to estimate their portion sizes. So by this, we meant that they could use um, handy measures, they could use the number of tablespoons, they could use the number of slices or pieces, rather than asking them to actually use a set of scales, because you can imagine carrying out a set of scales with you could be quite um, awkward at times. So um, I'm going to tell you a little bit later on what happened um, in the last two years. But just bear in mind that um, for most of NDNS, we've used a paper diary and we've asked people to write down what they eat. So moving on, I wanted to just share with you a couple of results from NDNS. So you're thinking, well, all this, all this effort, all these people being recruited across the country, um, you know, what, do, what does it give us? So um, I've got a couple of examples. And this is saturated fat intake from the NDNS. And what you can see is that I've taken some of the earlier surveys, so right back in the 1980s, right up to the present day, which runs along the x-axis. And um, I've split the um, average intakes of the NDNS survey participants into males in the blue column and females in the orange column. And the... Um, uh, y-axis shows the um, saturated fat intake expressed as a percentage of energy or calorie intake. Um, and this is um, how we report it in the, the NDNS. The black dotted line shows the dietary uh, recommendation or target is that saturated fat shouldn't make up any more than 11% of our energy intake. So two things really to just draw your attention to. The first is that you can see that there's quite a drop um, between the 1980s and the early 2000s in terms of saturated fat intake. And one of the interesting things here is that we had a lot of health promotion around choosing um, lower fat options and reducing our fat intake. In addition, we had things like semi skin milk coming onto the market and other lower fat products, which help facilitate some of this change. And then the second thing to point out is that we can still see today that saturated fat intakes do still remain, um, according to the NDNS, above targets. So it's really important that surveys such as the NDNS continue to monitor things like this so that we can monitor targets within the population. So a more recent example I can share with you, and this is, this is free sugars. So this is the NDNS in action again. And um, some of you may be more familiar with this. You've certainly probably seen quite a lot of newspaper stories over the last few years about having to, um, looking at the links between sugars and health, and therefore a real push to try and reduce the amount of free sugars that we have in our, in our diets. 
So um, by this, I mean free sugars are those sugars typically that we find in syrups and honeys, confectionery, um, sugar-rich drinks, biscuits and cakes and fruit juices. And um, sugars, for example, in milk and, and contained in whole fruits and vegetables would, wouldn't be counted as these free sugars. So um, there was a recommendation a few years ago to reduce our intake of free sugars to no more than 5% of our energy intake. And along with this, um, government announced a reformulation um, and um, a reduction program to encourage manufacturers to reduce the amount of free sugars um, in their foods, particularly things like breakfast cereals and yogurt and then soft drinks as well. Um, so here in the NDNS, I can show that um, we've been able to monitor free sugar um, intake within our NDNS populations. And what I've got here, what I can show you here is that um, this is children um, and young people. And this is just from 2008 onwards. So not back in the 1980s, but 2008 onwards. And this is sort of two year um, data from the survey, the orange line representing the target of no more than 5%, and the children split by the very young children to the older children. And two things here again, uh, you can see that clearly we have a very clear decline in free sugars, which is, which is good news, and I think we have similar things in the adults. Um, but the other point to make is that um, intakes do still remain above the uh, population target. And so there's still more work to be done and still more monitoring to be done by surveys such as the NDNS. And so I'm going to finish there and I'm going to hand over to my colleague Angela, who I think is going to take you through um, some more interesting information about NDNS. Thank you, Tony. Um, yes, I'm going to talk through some more of the data we have from the last 11 years of the NDNS rolling program. And here we have some information on milk consumption and the percentage of consumers of the different types. You can see that semi-skimmed milk is the most popular type, but that over recent years, alternative milks have started to become more popular in this NDNS sort of population group. Next slide, Tony, please. Sorry. Okay. Um, then we thought over this same time period, we'd have a look at um, the special diets that people say that they are currently on. Um, so you can notice from the y-axis that the percentage of participants who said they consume or follow one of these diets is quite low with it about 3%. Um, there's a slight fluctuation in vegetarian diets over the years, but it is the most popular one. But again, over the last few years, you can see a slight rise in gluten-free and vegan diets. And this is, again, one of the things that we're able to monitor using data from the NDNS. Next. Um, we chose one food item, um, thinking uh, it seems to be more popular. Shall we have a look at the NDNS recent data to see? Um, so we chose avocado. And you can see that the consumption um, percentage of consumers has risen from approximately 2% in year one um, to 8%. So it's still quite low, but it, um, it is on the increase. Okay, so now uh, we have another Zoom poll sort of question for you coming up. Um, and what we'd like you to estimate is which of these vegetables do you think was eaten most often over the last 11 years of the survey? So not necessarily in the greatest quantities, but most frequently reported in sort of diaries. So Paul, if you could do the Zoom poll, please. I think if you scroll down, are there more further on down or are they, do they all appear on the screen? Yeah, I think if you scroll down, there are some vegetables further on down. Just I think it just shows the first eight. 
Um, that is a very good question. It's it's in total, so it's um, in dishes or eaten as a, a sort of a vegetable in its own right. It's like a side sort of vegetable. You you're definitely thinking about this quite seriously. <laughs> Okay, you'll we'll probably leave it, I think, at that. That's, that's really interesting. Um, I don't know whether the, the question in the chat room made people sort of think differently about which one to choose. Um, oh, sorry, beans. I think it's it's not your sort of your baked beans, but it's your sort of your French beans, runner beans, those sorts of beans. But yeah, so the result of this um, Zoom poll was that 37% think the tomatoes are the most common. And then the next one is your onions. Okay, so if we have a look at the next slide, please. Thank you, Tony. Um, yes, so over the 11 year period, you can see that onions and tomatoes are the most commonly consumed or reported vegetable in the NDNS. Um, carrots comes in as a very sort of strong third the whole way through the 11 year period. And yes, as one of the audience members pointed out, um, onions and tomatoes are often um, parts of recipes and dishes rather than the vegetables eaten sort of in their own right. Um, and in the NDNS, we spent a lot of time on um, recipe dishes, disaggregating, splitting them up into their individual components in order to accurately um, be able to quantify um, fruit and vegetable intake. Okay, next please, Tony. And here we have some more sort of numbers for you. So over the 11 year period, there were about 15 and a half thousand participants. And over that time period, they consumed 3,600 800 gram loaves, 12,300 apples, 91,400 cups of tea. And what we'd like you to have a go at is estimating how many chipolata sausages you think were recorded in total over this 11 year period by all the participants. So again, we have some numbers here. So how many do you think? So there's almost 16,000 participants. Um, over this time period. Okay, I think we can probably close it at that. And again, yes. The correct answer is 35,700. So yes, most of you were sort of spot on. And um, another interesting fact is that that equates to about 3.5 kilometers of chipolata sausages that we have coded, um, which gets you from Edinburgh's hospital where we're based to the center of Cambridge. So we're full of interesting facts tonight. Okay, next please, Tony. Okay, so as you can imagine, um, assessing dietary intake does um, present some challenges. Um, the written food diaries that we receive from participants, sometimes it's quite difficult to decipher the handwriting and occasionally we receive food diaries that are written in different languages, not English. Um, we spent a lot of time coding recipes accurately um, from the food diaries and some of these recipes may contain up to 20 ingredients and spaghetti bolognese happens to be one of the most popular sort of recipes and every home has its own unique recipe for spaghetti bolognese so there's a, a lot of coding involved and um, we go to great lengths to gather accurate dietary data and we visit supermarkets to do this as not all the information is available online and from time to time, we've been um, approached by security, wondering what it is we are doing as we search their food packages. And um, we are able to reassure them that it is genuine sort of research and um, no arrests have ever been made. And once again, um, certain 
food items such as mixed leaf salad bags or bought sandwiches. Um, there's a lot of different ingredients in there and not all of this information is provided on the labeling. Um, so we, we open up the bags, we take them all apart, we weigh the different ingredients to get accurate um, amounts of the different components. And yes, there are some lighthearted moments in all of this. Um, we do a lot of sort of experiments and one of these has been to melt a fruit and nut bar of chocolate to work out the percentages of fruit and nuts present. Um, we have had a teenager that has consumed 15 old pizzas and we sort of thought, mm, they can have healthy appetites. Um, but we worked out eventually that it was a, an error in the questioning um, which led to this rather large amount. We encourage our participants to include food packaging um, with their food diaries so we can more accurately code what it is they have um, written. But occasionally this hasn't been washed and after it's been through the post and may have sat for a little while before we get to coding it, it can be rather smelly. And one food diary had a particularly pungent aroma and the participant had very kindly written a note to say, sorry, the cat used it as a toilet. Fortunately, that wasn't one that I had to cover. Okay. And now, if you'd like to take part in um, a little experiment, what we would like you to do is to get a bowl estimate, so not weigh, so no weighing scales just yet. So estimate what you think 40 grams of your cereal would be. So put in your portion. It's lovely, I've sort of, I've got an image of a, a very nice lady here. I can see, I can see her weighing, we're well, not weighing, but measuring at her, her cereal. Um, so estimate what you think 40 grams might be. And then when you've done that, get your weighing scales and, um, way out so either you can tip it into your scales if it has sort of a bowl type scale or get an empty cereal bowl zero it and then put it in and see what it actually is so i'll give you a moment or two for that and then we have a zoom poll question do you want to do that put up the zoom poll question paul please Okay, so we asked you to weigh out what you thought 40 grams would be. So if you could now sort of tick whether it was sort of less than 40 grams, 40 to 50, or sort of larger. Okay, I think shall we, as it start to slow down, shall we sort of end it there, I think. So almost half of you managed to sort of get sort of between 40 and 50, 25, sort of just under 40. So that, that's pretty good sort of going. It's not an easy thing to do, unless maybe you have two, you put two feet of X's into your bowl, and then I think it was a bit more straightforward. Um, but yes, you can see that it, it's quite hard to sort of know. So when you're a participant filling in a food diary, um, you know, you might estimate what you think it is, but actually you might be way out or you might think, well, I had a small portion, but you know, someone's small portion is not necessarily someone else's small portion. And if you're going to code a food diary and someone has a small portion of breakfast here, you, you don't know what that really means. Um, so I think, I'll probably hand over to you now, Tony, and we can say a little bit more about how things are dealt with now. Yes, I think so. Thank you, Angela. Um, 
Yes. So um, you all seem quite super duper actually in your in your estimations, but maybe it's because you're 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 kind of keen and you're just doing it once. And um, if you had to do it lots of times, it, it, it might get a bit more tiresome. So um, one of the challenges of, of estimated um, portion sizes and those estimated diaries is um, you know, providing those kind of accurate portion sizes that we need. And so what happened and what emerged over the last sort of 10 to 20 years, particularly, is the emergence of um, food portion images. So um, initially they came in paper version and um, we had these food atlas um, books, which would help participants estimate how big their portion sizes were. And um, we knew or we know that there's good evidence to show that actually these images are really good portion estimation aids um, and help the participant and also help us when we code diaries. So as you can imagine over the last sort of 10, 15 years, with these images and also with the, the, the advancement of technology and, and online tools, it won't probably be a surprise to you that over the last two years, the NDNS did a really detailed review of these automated online dietary assessment tools that were available. And um, a decision was made to move to uh, a tool called Intake24. And this is a, an online 24 hour recall. So it asks the participant what they had to eat over the previous 24 hours. They log on um, and they choose their foods. No more writing down and they can choose their portion size as well. So no more um, sort of weighing scales really for our participants. And there's an enormous advantage to these online tools because um, it's hopefully less onerous for the participant and they're more willing to take part and also saves us as the researchers a huge amount of time because it's all auto-coded. So all the foods are assigned to a food composition code, they're assigned to a portion weight. And we, we simply, well, I say simply, um, we just get the data out at, at the end with, with no coding and, and certainly no, um, no smelly Ziploc folders or, or funny cats or anything. Um, so this is the tool that we've moved to and the NDNS started using Intake24 uh, towards the end of 2019, I think. And um, so we're hoping that we will have the first results from this um, in the NDNS very soon, very shortly. And we're very excited about it um, because it allows us to add food images. It allows us to add extra foods if we see you know, a trend coming in. Um, so it gives us that flexibility, which, which we didn't quite have with, with the paper version of the, of the diary. And, one of the um, other potential advantages of the online tool is that it might allow us to scale up the survey. We could make it much bigger and we could have more people in it um, and we could do even more with, with the data we'd hope. So that's really the future of the NDNS um, and where we are, where we are right now as well. So just to finish up now, um, if you want to know more about the NGNS, there's a web link there. And I think Paul said that he would put it into the chat at some point. You can go there, you can pick up um, more detail about how we do the survey and also more detail on the results as well. And if you'd like to do a practical exercise um, when we finish the session today, if you go to the second link, that second link allows you to experience Intake24 as a... As a a dietary assessment tool. So you could experience what NDNS participants experience when they're asked now to complete a recall. This isn't part of NDNS data. Um, you have to be invited to, to join the NDNS, but nevertheless, this link would allow you to have a go at our new online tool um, and explore our, our foods and our portion images. Um, so I think we finish it there. And um, I think now we open it up to any questions, but, but thank you everybody for listening and for taking part. Great, thanks, Tony. Actually, if um, maybe stop sharing yet about saying to do that so we can see each other again. Um, yeah, thank you very much, Tony and Angela for that, uh, for that um, great discussion. Um,
Uh, I think we've got a few questions already, but I'd just like to remind everyone, if you'd like to ask a question, just please add it in, in um, the chat box. Uh, and uh, if you want us to, to unmute you for that, and let us know, otherwise we'll read it out. I think we've got a very good question to start with here from Roberta, which is, does the survey include socioeconomic and demographic information on the respondents? I said, I'm thinking here there might be differences in trends for certain foods and nutrient intakes for like such avocado, which tends to be more popular among the middle classes. Um, so just, yeah, good one to start. Yeah, that's a really good question. We, we, we do collect a lot of detailed information on participants, which I, I didn't have time to mention in the survey, but um, in the presentation, but yes, we do. And um, one of the challenges is, is making sure that we've got enough numbers within those specific socioeconomic groups to, to make those kind of analyses. Um, back, I think, in the earlier reports, the year one to four of the rolling program, we did do some um, work looking at nutrient intakes in um, income brackets, equivalised income. Um, and um, that report is available on the uh, NDNS website if you're interested. Um, I th think that's the one that I remember is the most recent one. Great. I just got another, uh, Rebecca was saying that'd be great if you're able to scale up the survey to include more participants from lower socioeconomic groups. Um, so clearly agreeing with that. Um, Emma says, uh, thank you for a great talk, extremely interesting, so thumbs up for that. Um, also, can she ask, uh, do you assess the nutritional intake of, small, of, of a small proportion of participants using the older methods, such as weighing foods and photos, to compare alongside the Intake24 data to check it? We don't. Um, what we do do in the survey is we use a technique um, called doubly labelled water, and this is a uh, very expensive drink of water, which really allows us to, um, sounds, sounds not nice, but it almost spy on people, but it actually measures in quite some detail what the energy intake is. And if we can measure the energy intake from the doubly labeled water, we can see how well our dietary assessment tool is performing in the survey. So whether it's the diary or the 24 hour recall, we always monitor how well it's performing by, by using our doubly labelled water techniques. OK, um, William has just asked, how are the um, socioeconomic groups defined? Uh, good question. Um, I think variously, and I would probably have to um, check with my colleagues at Natsen um, to see how they do that in the CAPI questionnaire. Um, there may be some information on the website that would give you more um, information on, on that too. Um, and the, 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 the CAPI questionnaire is available and you can look at the, the groupings in there. But I, off the top of my head, I, I, I can't say. OK, um, so just a question just come in here. Um, have you considered creation taking data from an app where participants can scan food packaging barcodes like MyFitnessPal does? Absolutely, we're always really interested. So this isn't the end point with Intake24, this isn't the end point, and we are really interested in exploring things like images, barcode scanning, which is really, I think it's the next phase. Um, so we, we've gone very quickly from a paper diary over the last couple of, two, couple of years into, into an automated tool, so it's been quite a big change. Um, but we are looking... Um, to those sorts of information so that it can help us um, provide detail around all the different food products that we have available. So yeah, good question. Okay, sorry, just let me um, reply to Pat here. Um, oh, one question for, from uh, one of our colleagues, uh, Do <laughs> Dolly, um, Dolly Tice. Uh, what happened the main policy related findings in terms of dietary changes? So are you talking, you're sort of thinking about the headlines of um, NDNS? Um, Dolly, would you like to be unmuted, actually? Thanks so much, Paul. Um, yeah, anything related? You mentioned the, the kind of policy tracking element at the beginning and just thinking in light of, you know, the soft drinks industry levy, but... 
I guess we're so up close to that. I wondered if there were any other additional ones that um, we might not be thinking about, or I certainly haven't thought about that you have come across of um, policies that have been introduced and maybe seeing changes that could be related to those. All right, I'd have to, I'd have to get thinking now. I'm not so, so quick at sort of um, coming up with those things. Um, I can say that, um, the survey is kind of geared up to to sort of react because it's a rolling program it is geared up to to react quite well to sort of up and coming health issues so for example um several years ago there was a um publication in the lancet which had some concern around iodine status particularly in young girls and we were able to um implement a spot urine sample in the ndns which enabled us to sort of look at very quickly the, the iodine status of the population. So it's not quite policy, Dolly, I appreciate that. Um, I'm just trying to come up with other examples. Um, yeah, I can't, I can't think of anything else on the top of my head, but um, obviously the, the survey monitors um, against you know, UK dietary recommendations um, and, and, and targets. So they are, yeah, part of what we look at in the survey. I think it's, it was worth it was it was quite cited several times in the recent um, uh, obesity um, report that the government produced uh, the um, the food that, that recent um, well, government report actually which uh, was published about uh, two months ago I think the food strategy food, food strategy that's what I'm thinking of. yes <laughs> yeah so it is it's certainly used um, okay somebody asked a question about the uh, does an individual that fills in the Intake 24 survey get any summary information at the completion of the questionnaire, um, for example, the results? Yes, they do. So um, one of the incentives that we've always had for our participants is that we offer them some dietary feedback. So that was even when they had a paper diary, we would give them some dietary feedback. But Intake 24 does that for us automatically. Um, so if you are interested in seeing what feedback they get, if you do complete um, a intake for demo, it will take you to the dietary feedback and you can have a look at what we um, what, what, what feedback we give people. Got a question from Irene here. Uh, who is this information mainly intended for? Uh, how does it fish with understanding of gut bacteria in which in foods uh, and changes, sorry, um, gut bacteria in food, which changes how different foods are assessed. Uh, okay, so the the, the, the data is, um, as I mentioned earlier, it's, it's funded by Public Health England and, and the Food Standards Agency, and um, it's used to, to monitor progress against um, health policies and nutrition policies, but can also be used by industry to, to model, um, you know, fortification scenarios. Um, it's used by researchers to do secondary analyses. Um, so it has a really um, wide um, area of use. Now, in terms of gut bacteria, I'm not sure, um, I'm not really sure um, or aware of anybody who's sort of used it specifically looking at, um, you know, perhaps different fibers, um, in you know consumption of fibers in the survey, I'm not aware anyone has, um, but I guess that there's no reason why somebody couldn't take some data um, and do some secondary analysis if if they were interested in that area. Another message. Uh, oh, somebody, Natasha Gandhi, has a question. Oh, that was a question, question about the app and taking photographs using barcodes. Um, so, uh, does anyone else have any questions? We seem to have run out currently, which isn't oh, really efficient. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yeah, it's actually. Um, I'm just wondering. You mentioned this, uh, the compliance level in 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 these studies. How how many of the of of the 
samples which you were sent were done properly. Um, you mentioned sometimes you get things which are unwashed and things, but was using that system before the online system, what was it generally pretty good? Uh, or uh, is it you're thinking about how many food diaries may have been ruined? Uh, yes, or yeah. or came with, with you had to use special protective garments to. Look <laughs> <at>. <laughs> um, no, it was it was it was never too bad that we couldn't we couldn't deal with it. And um, you know, every diary is precious, and every every piece of information is is always precious to us. And um, we always always strive to um, include. Um, records that people have taken the time to to fill in for us um, so the number of sort of diaries that are you know not filled in enough that we can't use them have been very low um, and we, we always try to get the best out of the data so it's it's sort of single numbers uh, I've got a question here from William Thorpe, actually. It's, what are the main trends shown by the results over the last 10 to 15 years? Essentially, are we getting better, maybe, or are things the same, same? Is it a mixed bag? Um, I think some things are getting better and some things are perhaps staying the same. So some of the, some of the main headlines from the report, which um, you can get from the, the, the website, um, is... is um, you know, sugar, free sugars are, are declining, but we're still above targets. Um, we still have some way to go with achieving um, our goals around things like dietary fibre intake. Um, iron intake, particularly in teenage girls, tends to continue to be a, um, a challenge. And um, fruit and vegetable intake, so our classic five a day message, um, is still it's improving but um, we still um, need more work for more people to achieve that by the day so at the moment i think um, adults are around about mm, four portions a day um, on, on average in our ndns population and i think that children are a bit lower so um Still more work to do around fruits and vegetables, still a little bit high in saturated fat. Um, we seem to be doing OK for things like trans fatty acids. So I think from memory, um, the targets around trans fatty acids are, are mostly met. Um, so, yeah, I'm sure there's some more headlines, but um, I think there's good news and I think that there's almost more, always more work to do as well, which, which is why, you know, these kind of surveys are really important to, to, to monitor that progress. Um, that's great. Uh, William has asked another question. Is portion size a major challenge? Um, not, not so much for, for more society for than for you. Are, are, are two large portions still too common? It, it, it can be um, really easy to consume larger portion sizes because, you know, we have um, larger portion sizes available in, in many food outlets. Um, and um, I'm not quite sure how finely tuned our safety mechanisms always are when we've got all this food that we're surrounded by. So I would say yes, that um, larger portion sizes are always challenging. Um, and um, we need to, to continue to monitor those, particularly in the MDNS, um, so that um, you know, we can um, make sure that we capture accurate intake in the MDNS and reflect what portion sizes that we've got available. Sorry, that was a bit waffly. I'm not sure that I've really answered that very well. <laughs> It's fine. Actually, discussing a kind of um, accuracy, I think one of the things that you've been discussing the questionnaires more here and the survey and people filled in um, is also the NDNS also uses laboratory studies as well for, for some aspects, I think. So that's, I think maybe, would you be willing to just talk about a few minutes, a minute or so about, about that and maybe some of the interesting results that have come from that as well? Oh, right, Paul, you've really put me on the spot. <laughs> Myself and Angela, we are, um, we're really a dietary assessment. We're the dietary assessment ladies. And um, we have another team who, who really are, you know, involved in doing the blood samples and the urine samples and then looking at nutritional status. Um, I don't know if we've got anyone in the audience who could come in on that. 
Um, but yeah, I, I don't feel I can really confidently say what kind of the, the nutrient status results are. Sorry. <laughs> That's okay. <laughs> I, sh I should have set you up for that one earlier. <laughs> Thanks, Paul. <laughs> Uh, so Polly's saying we should we should be encouraged to do another another session on the nutritional status and at a future yeah. time. Yeah, I think we'll probably do that. <laughs> um, Good plan. Okay. Um, right. Uh, I think we'll probably leave it there unless anybody else has another question. We've still got a few minutes, so there's probably enough room for one more if anybody anybody has anything. Otherwise, um, otherwise we'll we'll uh, we'll call it a day. Um, so actually, I think um, I'd like to thank um, thank uh, Angela and Tony for joining us this um, this evening, and, and thank um, Open Cambridge for actually inviting us to do this talk and and for um, including it. Um, there's probably not so many science talks, but I think there are quite a few actually. So it's um, it's good to, uh, to have a bit of crossover. Um, and also thank you guys for participating and for and for joining in on our activities and polls and, and uh, messing around with breakfast cereals. It's also um, really good to see um, see you all get involved that way. Um, I think uh, I'll share the links in a moment that we I shared earlier for the NDNS survey and for the intake twenty four. And also I'd like to just um, share quickly share one of my own um, a final slide, which has information on how you can you can join um, in our, some of our future events. So I will just share that now. Um, so let me just put something down here. Um, so yeah, thank you very much. Um, future MRC epidemiology events, um, we can share, I'll just put that in the link as well. So if you'd like to take part in our events, you can find them here. And also if you'd like to uh, subscribe to our email list where you can subscribe to get notification of events and newsletters and all sorts of other fun things. Um, I've added that there in the chat as well. So thank you all very much. I will leave this open just for a few minutes so we can copy any links and, um, and then we'll, uh, we'll call it a day. But thank you all for joining us tonight. Yeah, thank you very much.